Coming up on DTNS, Google decides to just leak stuff about the Pixel for itself. Blink twice to zoom with your eyes and an air-conditioned shirt. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, July 29th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. And from L.A. County, uh, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We were just having a lovely discussion of, of dog parks uh, and more on Good Day Internet. to uh, Get the expanded conversation at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start Daily Tech News Show with some tech things you should know. Analyst Ming-Chi Kuo says that his information indicates that Apple will release three 5G phones in 2020. All three models are expected to support MM Wave and sub-6 gigahertz spectrum used in the U.S. markets. Not terribly surprising, but good to be confirmed. The Fortnite World Cup Finals has a $3 million champ, 16-year-old Kyle Giersdorf, screen name Bugha. The event drew 2 million concurrent live streams on Twitch and YouTube, and thousands of fans came to the event live at Arthur Ashe Stadium in Queens, New York. In the pairs competition, European duo Emil Bergquist Pedersen, a.k.a. Nyrox, and David Wang, a.k.a. Aqua, clinched the $3 million grand prize in that category. Man, I gotta start playing Fortnite. TikTok maker ByteDance announced that it's developing a smartphone with device maker Smartisan Technology. The Chinese financial news outlet Keijing reports that the phone has been in development by Smartisan for the past seven months and is being led by former Smartisan exec Wu Dezhou. The EU Court of Justice has ruled that websites that embed the Facebook like button or a similar social plugin are responsible for the data collected and sent to a third party via that button. The ruling stems from a 2015 lawsuit against Fashion ID, a retail shop in Germany. So it was uh, the, the suit was filed by a German consumer group who accused the site of collecting visitor data without prior approval through the Facebook like button. The court ruling was based on the EU's older data protection directive and should still apply under the more stringent GDPR. Apple released images of a prototype new screen de described as a waterfall as the viewable portion of the front screen wraps around the edges at 88 degrees, almost a straight right angle. Apple didn't detail what sides would be used for, what they would be, if they would be touch sensitive or not, or where the power and volume buttons would go. But this could be something that is used in an actual phone model. Hmm. We'll see. Oppo or OnePlus. Both mm -hmm. same all right, let's talk a little more about that Pixel 4 leak. leak. Let's do it. Leak. It's a post. I keep calling it a leak accidentally, yeah. <laughs> Google posted details, real details, yeah. of its upcoming Pixel 4 phone's top bezel. The bezel includes Soli, which, is, which it says powers motion sense, allowing for gesture controls without touch. Google's advanced technology and projects team developed Soli, which works with radar. Motion Sense will be available in select countries, likely because it works in the 57 to 64 gigahertz frequency band, which ours technic Technica points out in the U.S. requires a special dispensation to lift power limitations on those bands. Along with Soli and a selfie cam are two face unlock cameras using infrared and dot projection, similar to Apple's Face ID. Google says that Soli lets the phone unlock as you're picking it up, however. Very cool. Facial data never leaves the phone and isn't shared with other Google services, according to the company. Same goes for Soli. Yeah, but before we get to the actual details here, uh, I, I feel like it's a, it's a, a milestone that we've hit where Google says, <laughs> you know, everything just leaks out anyway. We're just going to start getting in front of that and posting some details ourselves. So here you go, uh, ahead of the announcement, generate some excitement. And I think it worked, I think it worked because the uh, the radar stuff is something people have been seeing ATAP talk about for a long time. It does not to seem to be at the same level of precision that they have demonstrated in the lab, but I guess that makes sense in practice. Uh, I know you are real excited though at the idea that that radar can tell when you're picking up the phone and start the facial recognition happening so you don't have to pick up the phone and look at it every time. Yeah, I mean, I I know I'm I'm somewhat in the minority of, of Face ID haters, but I really do hate it. I miss Touch ID. It just worked a lot better. And the and the reason is because, you know, even despite lots of people writing in with with great uh, uh um <clears throat> uh, yeah, uh offers 
of offers of like how face ID could work better for Sarah. The fact is, is that half the time my phone is, you know, on the other side of the table, not near me. And it, it's, you know, to, to pick it up and look at it is not always all that uh, convenient. So this is awesome. If it works, I could switch. I was going to ask you that. Like, would you be getting a <laughs> Pixel 4 by the end of the year? I don't know, man. I, it sounds crazy, right? But but maybe, yeah. Not that crazy. Most of the world uses Android phones. Pixel 4s are, Pixels are very good phones. Seems like the Pixel 4 is shaping good, up to be a really good phone. Good point, Tom. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I mean, you know, it might be, uh, this, might, this might be the year for us. Yeah. It will be interesting to see. Uh, whether that motion sense is 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 held back by the approval levels, they they had to get special dispensation, like Sarah said, in the United States. Some countries may not be willing to give that special dispensation. We'll we'll follow that and see how it goes. Meanwhile, the race is on for AI. Researchers at Harvard and MIT IBM Watson Lab have created the Giant Language Model Test Room, or GLTR, that can identify whether a piece of text was generated by a language model algorithm. In other words, AI recognize AI in text. <laughs> it analyzes word distribution, which is more predictable in text made by a machine. In fact, in the, in the demonstrations, uh, they kind of grade it as green or yellow, whether this word was predicted. And when you look at the graph of words written by humans, we're often throwing in things that are purple or red. Like that was an unexpected word. Whereas AI always does the more likely word. So it's able to look at that and say, we think this was written by an AI. Uh, GLTR is able to detect fake text about 72% of the time, but humans uh, basically can detect fake text about 54% of the time. So we're not bad, but we're not as good as GLTR. Next Web notes that a tool called Botometer is already out there. That one can identify whether an account is operated by a bot about 95% of the time. So uh, here we go. The, the worry about whether AI will make a world in which we can't tell what's real, uh, moderated a little bit by the idea that AI will also help us tell when things are being faked. So to ask a really dumb question. Okay, so when I argue with a bot on Twitter and someone, you know, four hours into it is like, Sarah, that's clearly a bot on Twitter and you didn't realize it because you're a human. <laughs> is this the sort of thing that's supposed to squash that problem? I feel like Botometer is. Botometer is, is is being touted as something that, you know, social networks could use to be like, oh, that's definitely a bot. Let's, let's see if that's a bot that should be allowed. Some bots are good. I have a bot that automatically posted things. I don't think it's allowed anymore, but, but not all bots are bad or whether it's like, oh, this is, this is astroturfing. This is, this is trying to manipulate the system. So yeah, Botometer could do that. And that this kind of AI on AI could be able to tech, tell like, oh, posts on these posts on Facebook seem to have been artificially generated. Let's call attention to them and see if they need heavier moderation. Yeah. Well, and also if a tool like this works well, it works as advertised, what happens? What happens to the bots? You know? An race happens. The bots get better. Well, this forces the bots to be like, how do we evade detection? Let's increase our algorithm. And then the detection algorithms have to get better. And we're to where we are with everything with technology, uh, where there's a constant pressure to try to outdo the other side and get around it. But again, okay, you mentioned Facebook. Okay, let's say that uh, a bot detector is really good. Mm -hmm. Does Facebook have to buy that company and use the technology in order I mean, to filter out a bunch of stuff? They don't have to buy that company. Uh, they're mm -hmm. probably investigating whether they can use this kind of technology in some way, right? But it's yeah. never going to be perfect. It, you were never going to be able to like, oh, we found the AI, we turned it on, now everything's fine. Everything, Everybody can go back to relaxing. <laughs> Well, you know what I like to do besides relaxing is eat. Uh, the New York mm. Times reports wow. that its sources say that Amazon is exploring creating a grocery store chain separate from Whole Foods, which it bought a couple years ago. The new stores would be designed with pickup and delivery in mind, combined with a small area for picking out fresh goods like produce. A memo from 2017 described ordering non-fresh goods on an app that would be brought down and made ready at checkout. Amazon has advertised for jobs that are part of, quote, creating multiple uh, customer experiences under one roof. Apparently, Amazon is looking for spaces near Whole Foods locations as well. 
Yeah, this is interesting. So it seems separate from their convenience stores, the ones with, that are automated, although I'm going to guess they're going to try to use that automated technology somehow. Yeah, here, the too. Amazon Go stores. Yeah, yeah. But it's more of a grocery store. And in the memo from 2017, which is, of course, before Amazon bought Whole Foods, it described a situation where either upstairs or in a separate part of the building, all of the paper towels and 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 the commodity items are kept. And the customer just walks in and is like, oh, okay, I want to pick a nice cantaloupe, some fresh pork. Uh, on your app is where you like, and I need, you know, paper towels and saran wrap and all that sort of thing. That stuff's just brought out for you, trying to combine the best of online ordering and in-person shopping. And it's interesting that they are differentiating this from Whole Foods, right? It's, it's not saying Whole Foods is our grocery store and we'll change it into this. They're saying, no, Whole Foods is for a particular kind of shopper and we don't want to affect that. So we'll create this other kinds of grocery store but have it near the Whole Foods so that whatever you want, you can go to both places. And the New York Times article even mentions that the news stores could probably act as a warehouse for items from the Whole Foods, which would help out with delivery since Whole Foods usually doesn't have a big back of store area uh, and just stocking items uh, for efficiency between the two locations. Doesn't it sound so Amazon though, to be like, hey, no, we're, we're gonna let you continue on our platform, but we're also gonna start competing with you in our own way. Well, with themselves, right? Because it is them, Whole Foods yeah. is them. So it is. So yeah, it is very much, it is very Amazon. It's also kind of Apple where the idea is, we would rather lose to ourselves than someone else. So let's compete with ourselves. You know, there's a, um, Whole Foods has a, and I'm, I'm not sure how many markets this is in, but it has a 365 uh, store that's not far from where I live, which is all Whole Foods 365 branded things. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like somewhere between a Whole Foods and a Trader Joe's, hard to say. If you like the brand, great. You're gonna you're gonna find stuff that you like. But um that's the bargain brand, right? That's the it stuff is. That's less expensive. It is, but I but I wonder, you know, how many of these franchises are we going to have? Because if Amazon does this right. Everyone's just going to go to the new Amazon store. I mean, Whole Foods, I, I'm a Whole Foods person. I've, I've been shopping at Whole Foods for many, many years now. Um, and I, you know, I, I like the experience for the most part. But the fact that this wouldn't be bundled into where I already go is sort of problematic for me. My guess is the 365 store is a step towards this new Amazon store, which is let's come up with something for people who don't feel like they can afford to shop at Whole Foods. And maybe this new Amazon store leans into that crowd. But there are people who shop Whole Foods who are like, absolutely not. I will not go buy commodity items, non-organic items. You know, I I want the selected curated Whole Foods experience. Sure. I want to yeah. talk to people. So I imagine that Amazon feels there's probably a good bet that you, you'll keep yeah. a lot of whole food shoppers. There's always going to be, yeah, that that sector of people who feel like they want the the you know the the enhanced grocery experience. Yeah, and the other one's more of a convenience of like, how do we make the person who wants to shop online but also needs to like see a couple of things in person? How do we come up with a new version of a grocery store from the ground up built specifically for that kind of shopper? Well, I look forward to seeing it, Amazon. Yeah. Be interesting. Uh, Amazon says they don't comment on rumors and speculation. So no, no confirmation from them on any of this. Scientists at Stanford have developed a way to detect packets of vibrational energy called phonons, often referred to as quantum sound, not photons. That's light. Phonons is sound, and they are the smallest known units of sound. Information in a quantum computer could be stored in phonons instead of photons, which could then store more info in a smaller space than using light or photons. The scientists built a device that detected the phonons, the audio, using small resonators that measure vibrations with different energy levels corresponding to different numbers of phonons. The upshot here is quantum computers getting faster and more efficient to run if they can implement this research from Stanford. How do they get more efficient with phonons? I understand the concept of phonons. It's really yeah. cool. But but how, like, how does it work? Uh, but they, you can store more info in a smaller space than you would using light. Uh, they're, they're, just, they're just better at, at transferring the information. I don't know. 
I'm you I'm can't into use it. it in a vacuum though, right? <laughs> right. You gotta That's have something to, to send the sound. I think I don't know. Quantum physicists, write in feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com and let me know. Maybe quantum uh, phonons uh, can be used in a vacuum, and I don't realize it. Maybe they, they use dark energy or something crazy. But I I still I think even though they are very small sound, they still need a medium to vibrate, right? Yes, one would think so. That said. Being able to store more information in a smaller space than using light. <laughs> you know, I mean, I grew up, we all did, you know, it'd be like nothing uh, faster than the speed of light, you know? So it's like, it's one of these things that I'm trying to wrap my head around. Well, I, I think it has to do with the receptors. Uh, yeah, I think the resonators probably would, it's my guess uh, that the resonators are, are where it becomes more efficient because it's not a, you're still storing it the way you normally store things. You don't store things with light. You store things in silicon. You flip bits, right? Right. Um, and, and so the way quantum computers work are with states of energy. But it may be in interpreting the phonons, these resonators are more efficient. Again, well, quantum physicists, please write in and let us know. Please do, yeah. I mean, sounds great. Uh, just, uh, on the science tip, scientists at the University of California, San Diego have created a contact lens you put in your eye controlled by eye movements that can zoom in if you blink twice. <laughs> it's like my dream come true. The scientists measured the electro-oculographic signals from eyes to create a soft biometric lens that responds to those electric impulses with the ability to change its focal length depending on the signals generated. Now, this one I actually did look into uh, to find out exactly how it worked because it didn't require a degree in quantum physics. Uh, <laughs> oculographic is... The, the change in the electric potential in your eye caused by your eye movement. So blinking is, is an eye movement that, that changes the potential. And, and they have created a, a very comfortable, I suppose, using a contact lens way of detecting that uh, without having to put electrodes in your eyes that they can then use to send a signal. And then changing the contact lens to zoom in changing the uh, like the focal length of your contact lens that's the other part of the technology that's interesting here um i i, I mean it sounds like a web browser doesn't it you know where i'm like zoom in you know every once in a while if i link to got to read text yeah, yeah and then like zoom back out it's it's you know it's, it's it's once you get the hang of it if this works as advertised it is awesome now we're we're imagining like bionic eye type stuff. Uh, the the practical uses, according to the CNET article, are visual prostheses. Uh, so so being able to control the focal length with your eye movements with with something that is improving your vision. Uh, adjustable glasses. So you would blink in order to change the glasses focal length. That wouldn't affect your direct vision. Uh, and remotely operated robotics. So blink to control. Right. There's all kinds of things you could do with that ability to sense the potential here. Uh, this is pretty, this is pretty wide ranging stuff. You know, the thing I'm trying to focus on is it's not just what you can do with the contact lens. It's the fact that you can use the blinking and the eye movement left and right. Uh, you can now sense it more easily. To, yeah. To, to trigger stuff. anything. Yeah. 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 I, I, it, it, you know, my first reaction of course is like, Oh, well, you know, you're going to blink wrong and something terrible is going to happen. Um, that's not really what this is about. Um, the the overarching capabilities of this are are vast. And, I, it, you know, it kind of just, it sort of plays into, you know, gesture stuff. It's, you know, gestures yeah. with your eyes. Yeah, for, for, for people like Stephen Hawking, uh, who, who needed uh, some, some very custom technology to be able to communicate, um, you know, blinking is something that he could have done and would have allowed him more control over what he had versus the the blowing and all that. So yeah, uh, really, really interesting stuff. It's hot <laughs> yes, in it is. most of the world right now. <laughs> it really um, is. Feels like anyway. I know it's hot in Europe. It's hot in the United States and Canada. It's usually hot in Mexico uh, in large parts uh, at this time of year. Uh, so they're not uh, excused from being hot over in Japan, especially when we're getting close to August. Sony's crowdfunding site, First Flight, has announced the Rion Pocket, a pocket-sized air conditioner that fits in a shirt. 
starting at 12,760 yen, which is uh, around 117 bucks US right now, expected to ship in March, 2020. In time for next summer, the Rion Pocket uses the Peltier effect, which uses a small electrical current to absorb or give off heat. You can use this in the winter to warm yourself up too. The shirt can cool someone by 13 degrees Celsius, that's 23 degrees Fahrenheit, or in the winter, heat you up by eight degrees Celsius, 14 degrees Fahrenheit. It's controlled, as you might've guessed, with an app over Bluetooth and charges over USB-C. Battery life of the device is rated at 24 hours for the Bluetooth connection. Uh, with about two hours of active cooling or heating. It's got a thermostat, so it'll turn itself on and off. The Rion Pocket will only be available in Japan, sadly. But uh, I know we got some folks out there in Japan who wants we to do. Up and try it out for us. Oh, please do. Please do, because I'm already jealous. Uh, you know, my my initial questions are things like, well, okay, if it's in some my shirt, do I see it? Is it going to bulge? You know, like how 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 well is this going to radiate uh, cool or heat depending on the time of year um for me, but in general, I want this. Well, did you see the video? Yeah. The, the promotional video, so it it's it slips in the back of your your shirt, right? So it's kind of out of the way. It's it can be worn <laughs> under your normal white shirt, right? So you can, you can just, you know, look, what, what, what's You're a normal wearing, white shirt, the white shirt, the, the, the white dress shirt that the salary man wears in Japan. Uh, I see. Got yeah. it. Uh -huh. What they're wearing in the yep. video. Basically. Yep. Um, and, and so you, you look perfectly professional. Nobody knows, but of course in the, vi in the hilarious video, there's the one guy who's cool outside and the other guy's sweating and, well, you know, wiping off his forehead and everything. Cause you know, the smart guy has the real pocket. I don't, a Peltier effect's real. It can work. Uh, Roger pointed out in our pre-show uh, that those uh, in-dash air conditioners they used to sell for cars use the Peltier effect um, to, to provide a tiny bit of cooling. I don't know how well this is going to work, though. It, it's The thing is Peltier only works on very small things. Like It does not scale. So if you were to make a so refrigerator, the bigger you are, the worse this is going to work. So, and I mean, that's why it's such a little device. But I was thinking they would put it in areas of your body that would require more cooling, like maybe under the arms or something. Mm. Uh, I'm wondering if that back hump area between your shoulder blades is is the most effective place. I mean, it could be. I I don't know, but. I don't know. I, 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 the other day, and it's very hot in LA, as Roger and Tom know at this, at this time of year. And I, I picked up some, you know, spin drifts, right. But, and they were cold coming out of the a cooler. And it was like, it was so hot that I just kind of put it on the back of my neck as I walked home a mm -hmm. few blocks. And mm -hmm. it really made a difference. I mean, I'm not sure how much the placement of it matters if you're getting the cooling that you're asking for. Well, yeah, because this does require some heat removal. The Peltier effect doesn't just eat the heat. Uh, so having it at the back allows it to vent the heat out away from you more easily, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm curious if this is just another like kind of toy, basically, that doesn't really work that well. It's very Japan, that's for yeah. sure. Yeah. Uh, but, it, but, but it might make a lot of sense. Yeah. We'll yes. have to wait and see. It's from Sony, after all. You know, it's not it's not uh, a company we've never heard of before. I've heard of Sony. You've heard of Sony, right? I have. I have a Sony television. Yeah. <laughs> Folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Also, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit daily. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We're also on Facebook. Join our group if you haven't already. Facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. Now let's check in with Chris Christensen, a.k.a. the Amateur Traveler, who has a tip on accessing emergency help when you're traveling internationally. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. And thanks to my wife for spotting this in the Airbnb magazine. I didn't know if you know that they had a magazine. But if you are traveling and you have an emergency and you want to call the emergency number, if you're in the States, you'd call 911. But that's not going to work if you're in France or if you're in Bangladesh. Do you know what number to call? And if not, there's an app for that. You can use the app Trip Whistle Global SOS, which you'll just have to look up where you are, and it will tell you what number to call. Very simple app, simple application, but it might give you a little peace of mind. I'm Chris Christensen 
from Amateur Traveler. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I would like to give it location information so it could just tell where I am and tell me what the emergency number should be, you know? I also, uh, uh, Airbnb, the magazine, for whatever reason, was delivered to my house. <laughs> I only got the one. <laughs> it was a few months ago, so I'm not I'm not uh, apparently signed up, but it's pretty cool. It's actually yeah, like that with what Nicole Lee, I think we talked about all these. these that's magazines. right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. That's interesting. Thank you, Chris. Let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Mike wrote in and said, I'm a UX designer, front end developer, and have been dealing with the, ex the issue of accessibility for over 15 years. A few years ago, the province of Ontario, Canada, introduced a new accessibility law, Accessibility of Ontarians with Disabilities Act, or AODA, was created as a result of a lawsuit. The same kind of lawsuit you were talking about on Friday's show. The law doesn't have draconian standards. It simply outlines dates and guidelines for implementation. So, for example, organizations of a specific size would need to meet the WCAG 2.0 AA standard by a specific date. It gave organizations time to implement and a specific standard to follow. Everyone panicked. Mm -hmm. They thought that they'd never be able to meet the standards and that the standards were too complicated. The funny thing is that I've never had a client complain about the end result of an accessible product. Every one of the products that we use cost the same amount of money, and most of them worked better for everybody because we accounted for the edge cases of a <clears throat> 11Y. Pardon me. Turns out that everybody benefits from a clear, well-designed product that focuses on function before form. We never get anything perfect. We try our best. And when we find an issue, we fix it. But in general, we ask ourselves a couple of questions. Can I access everything on the page with a keyboard? Is the language used inputs clear and uh, understandable? And if I make this black and white, will I still tell what to click when? When you fix those issues, you solve most of the problems and make a better product for everyone. That's cool. And Mike was among a few people who pointed out that in the United States, the government has standards for accessibility. Uh, Section 508, if you're making a website that requires government approval, section508.gov tells you what those standards are. Uh, so it's not like the US government doesn't already have standards. It's just that it only applies to themselves. So that's why Domino's can still have a defense in the lawsuit saying, well, there's no ADA requirement for us because we don't make websites for the government. Uh, but it would be pretty easy to just say, hey, we've got standards, section 508, let's apply those to the Americans with Disability Act and then we're done. Or, you know, a company like Domino's could just voluntarily um, uh, employ the section 508 standards and make their sites accessible. There are lots of ways to solve this problem is what it comes down to. And thanks to everybody who wrote in about those. And thanks to you folks who support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash DTNS gets you all kinds of member benefits. It is the best way to directly support us. Remember uh, that we are not a big company. Uh, we don't have a uh, Condé Nast or, or, or uh, uh, Fox News or anybody so, you know, giving us money. You're giving us money. The majority of our budget comes from you. So if you can afford to, and I know not everybody can, you know, sometimes folks are between jobs. We totally understand that. Uh, but if you can help us out, patreon.com slash DTNS. If you have feedback, we'd love to hear it. And our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're also live Monday through Friday. Join us if you can, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC, and find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Shannon Morse as our guest. Patrick Beige is on vacation. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>